Oh hey, it's Wes, and it's finally time to talk about the new Godox V1 on camera flash. Let's hit it. So the V1 is the much anticipated successor to the existing Godox V860 II. So what do we get from this? Why did we need a new flash? Well, the landscape had been changing a bit, and honestly, it has a lot to do with the release of the new Profoto A1 and A1X on-camera flashes, which they call on-camera studio strobes. So how does this compete? How does it work? Is it any good? Let's talk about that. First, I'm going to go through, as usual, rating the various aspects of this device, but be sure to stick around. I've got lots of awesome image samples and some fun stuff to go through. Number one, build quality. Now, I don't really want to talk about this flash in a vacuum because it's impossible to think about this flash without thinking about the V860 at the same time, also known as the Flashpoint R2. Pretty much everything we say about this flash is going to be in relation to that. So build quality, it feels very similar to the V860 Mark II. Possibly just a little bit hardier. I'm not sure if it actually is though. What have they changed? Well, obviously, you've got the new round head, which accommodates the new magnetic accessories. You can slap this dome on here, we've got a grid, we've got diffusers, and we've got gels, which is great and fun. Yes, it is both great and fun. Sometimes I use the gels to balance out the light with incandescent at a wedding reception, sometimes just for effects. I'm going to show you some real interesting stuff that I did with the dome in a few minutes here. And, I mean, is it super necessary to buy this flash for more money than the V860 Mark II when for just a few dollars, you can get the round head adapter for the V860 Mark II. Yeah, that looks a little bit janky, I guess, but if you want to save a buck, you can save a buck. We'll get into more of that later. If you flip these around, one of the biggest differences, for me at least, are the screens and the user interface. No, it's not just a different color, but you have a bicolored LED to show you when it's charging and when it's ready to fire, which is actually pretty useful. You have the new clicking quick release hot shoe, which does save a lot of time over the old screw on type. And if you look real close at the bottom here, we have a slightly redesigned Sony shoe. Now, if you have a Canon or a Nikon variant, it's not going to be a big difference. But you have a little more plastic on the bottom here. It's going to be a little sturdier. Overall, though, it's still very plasticky on the foot. And one of the last big differences is the new battery. You push it straight through and it comes right on out. So what does that give us, this new battery? Almost nothing. And that's kind of a shame. You expect to maybe get more power, more something from this new battery. But really, it's just a new and interesting design. Some would say that it's easier to pop out, but pretty stiff, and it doesn't really fly out of there, which is probably for the best. Whereas with the V862, I can get the battery in and out of that pretty quickly anyway. Maybe it's just because I'm used to using it. For me, personally, my number two biggest difference, next to the new and improved menu system, the backwards tilt. Now when you're using this flash for a bounce flash, you don't have to spin it all the way around to get it to go backwards anymore, like you have to do with pretty much every other flash out there. It's the simplest little design change. You can flip it right back without spinning it around. Boy, does that save time and annoyance. Anyway, before we get too much into the differences in light on these, we'll just call it even on the build quality for now, and we're gonna say that the build quality of this is an eight out of 10. It's not a tank, still has a plastic shoe, but it's still pretty solid. Moving on to light quality, another place where we have differences. I ran these two through a little bit of a high-speed sync test to see if one of them was brighter, because, I mean, they are rated for about the same light output, but high-speed sync can cause some pretty interesting effects with your flashes. They get weaker as you get to a higher shutter speed, and as you get to a higher power output, it can get even weaker still because it struggles to put out those pulses. And so, I'm just going to flip through some photos here. We are doubling the power, so we're going from 1 eighth to 1 quarter to 1 half to 1 over 1, while we're having the f-stops. So we're having the light coming into the camera, doubling the power going out. 
As you can see, we are lowering in overall power when we go up in high speed sync. That's perfectly normal. We're still seeing the same electronic first curtain shutter banding. Now that can be totally eliminated by turning on your full mechanical shutter, turning off electronic first curtain shutter. But that was a secondary thing that I wanted to find out whether or not electronic first curtain shutter banding is affected with this new design. It's pretty much identical. Talking about stability, this isn't a pro line from Godox. This is just, it's just a flash. It doesn't have exceptional color stability. It doesn't have exceptional light stability. It is still quite stable. I haven't really noticed that much variation and shift myself. Quite reliable, even when you're hitting it hard until you get to that calculated overheat point, which you can learn more about in my uh, overheating torture test video. Until you get to that point, it is extremely reliable, but then again, so was the V860 Mark II. But overall, it's just a flash. It's nothing earth shattering, but it's a solid one. Light quality, it's a seven out of 10. Feature set. This is where this guy knocks it out of the ballpark. Godox has put everything into this. As we have talked about before, you have the magnetic front. You have an LED light built into this. Not super bright, but hey, if you want it, it's there. You have the backwards lean. You have the lithium ion battery pack that, oh boy, it goes a long time. I decided to not charge this between two weddings in one weekend. Lots of backup V860s and Honestly, it didn't matter. I couldn't run this thing out. You have the ability to control multiple flashes from this flash if you set it into transmitter mode. And this is, as I mentioned earlier, one of my favorite parts of this flash. You have quick links to each of the power levels, each of the groups. You can just double tap this thing and uh, get your group on, get your group off, adjust power, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. I really like this design. In the V860 Mark II, adjusting the group power levels versus adjusting the power levels of flash itself, ugh, it's just annoying getting in and out of those settings. You can't do it quickly. It's kind of an artificial advantage. I'm pretty sure that Godox could just update the software firmware of the V860 Mark II and have it operate exactly the same way. But it is still an advantage, even if it is an artificial one. And then you have to talk about just the overall ability to interact, interface with the entire Godox lineup, all their modern flashes, transmitters, they all talk together. That is a solid feature. Doesn't put it over the V860 Mark II, but puts it over a lot of flashes. So for feature set, there's really nothing that this is missing for what it is. Perhaps it could be more powerful, but it would be bigger in that case. I would love for it to be more powerful, but honestly, I can't knock it. They've crammed everything into this flash. Feature set, it's a 10 out of 10. Value. That is where this thing gets a little bit more complicated. It's a Godox flash, so it's a pretty good value. This thing comes in at $260 in the United States, more in Canada up here. But the V860 Mark II comes in at 180. That's 80 bucks less. And then you can get the AA battery powered version of this guy, the TT685, for $110. That's less than half as much as this. Within the Godox lineup, this is not a screaming value. It doesn't give you more power. It doesn't give you a lot of more features. Just rounds it off real nice to be a great flash. But still, you're paying a fair amount more money for just a little bit more. But then if we break outside of the Godox ecosystem, Let's look at the Profoto A1, which this compares very directly with. That's $800. Then there's the A1X, which has more power, better recycle, blah, 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 blah. But it's $1,100. So it's better. Is it four and a half times better? No, not really. But still, if you need the ultimate power in an on-camera flash, that's the A1X. Even comes in Sony now. And then if we just look at the first party flashes, which some people prefer to stick that way. I used to have Sony flashes, found that they overheated way too fast. Apparently they've gotten better at that now. But the Sony F60RM is 500 bucks. The Canon 600EX Mark II, 480 bucks, about the same. And the Nikon SB5000, 600 bucks. That's a premium, but you usually pay a premium when you're talking about first party stuff. 
If this existed just fighting against the first party flashes, it would probably be a 9 or 10 out of 10 of value, but it has to compete with this still. And this is still a phenomenal flash for less money. So I'm gonna give this a 7 out of 10. Okay, it's not perfect. And the value proposition, it is difficult. I still, most days, am going to recommend the V860 Mark II over anything else. It is phenomenal value, that lithium ion battery pack is solid. It will last you through an entire wedding day or whatever it is that you do, no problem. This doesn't give you more power, doesn't give you faster recycle, it doesn't give you a longer time between firing fast and overheating. But it does give you all those extra features that you could ever possibly want with the built-in magnetic mount, the back folding, the better menu interface. If you want the best within any reasonable price, this is a fantastic flash. If you just need a reliable flash and want to spend as little as possible, it's either this or the TT-685. So that kind of seems boring. Is that it? Well, I wanted to really put this thing to the test. I wanted to go ham on this thing and see what I can actually accomplish with it. So I went crazy. I went out in the morning, went to the river, I put the dome diffuser on this. Why? Because I decided to use this flash with my seven foot Westcott parabolic umbrella. That's a crazy idea. So how did I get this to fire enough light into this umbrella to have a reasonable photo shoot? Well, let me tell you. As I said before, we went out in the morning, so there's not too much ambient light around. I'm shooting at about f1.4, not that demanding. And here's the key, even though my shutter speed had to go pretty high, normally, I used a variable ND filter on my lens so that I could always keep my shutter speed down around 1 200th of a second, which on the a7 III and a9, which I was shooting with, that keeps you within sync as long as you stay below 1 250th. And so I didn't have to use high speed sync on this so I could get all the power that I wanted. This was shooting at between 1 half and 1 over 1 power, so it was going hard and it was going for about an hour straight. But apparently there was enough uh, break between changing positions in the river that this held out. If you want to check out more of that model's work, her name's Monica, you can check her out on Instagram at Miss M Cosplay. She does great work. And she was phenomenal working in the river. It got hot, it got sunny, maybe there were leeches, but that was a great photo shoot. This did not overheat the entire time. It probably should have, because Godox uses a numerical algorithm to decide whether or not their flashes are going to overheat. Even the 8600 Pro is not actually based on heat, it's based on how quickly you're firing your flash. You can find those numbers in the manuals, you can download that online. So sometimes when I'm using the 8600 Pro, like in minus 30 degrees Celsius, it is freezing. The flash itself hasn't even gotten past 10 degrees Celsius. It's firing like crazy. It will overheat and stop working. This drives me nuts because it's not actually based on a thermistor, an internal thermometer of any kind. It just counts up, decides that it's fired too many times, and then I take the battery off, put it back on. Now, I always make sure that the flash isn't actually that hot when I do that. Similarly with this guy, you can pop out the battery, put it back in and keep it going for the most part. At that photo shoot though, after I was done, this thing was so hot that you could not hold it. I'm kind of surprised the plastic didn't melt. It's still working fine now, but it will keep going as long as you're not, you know, machine gunning it. That is what you can do with this little flash right here. That's phenomenal. Could I have done it with this? If I put the adapter on this guy and then the dome diffuser, there is going to be a little bit of light loss just because of the added depth. Maybe I could have done it with the V860 Mark II as well. Normally I would be using an 8600 Pro in that circumstance, and then I could have like fired that light right across the river. Otherwise, I had to stay pretty close. But there you have it. This is a phenomenal little on-camera flash. Is it perfect? Is it the best in the world? Probably not. Is it the best value? Probably not. Is it the most well-rounded flash for your money to give you all the features that you could want? That is what it is. Is it for you? I can't decide that. But if it is, I've got links in the description. Also have links for the V860 Mark II. It all depends on 
what you do, and how you use it. I didn't even talk about the round shape of the light coming out of this. This is my little PS. Well, you can watch my AKR1 and round flash adapter for the 8200 video. Click there. It makes a small difference when you're doing bounce flash. If you're firing this straight at a crowd, the edges of the light will be a little smoother. But honestly, the whole round flash phenomenon, unless you're doing bounce flash all day every day and that's all you do, even then the difference is marginal. It's kind of a gimmick, but it allows you to use the round magnetic adapters. And honestly, that's the only thing that really matters to me about this round design. Sure, marginally smoother light, but I'll take these magnetic adapters any day. Super convenient. I'm addicted to them. So, until next time, go take some photos.